the Global Extractivism and Alternatives Initiative, EXALT, and Helsinki Institute for Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Helsinki. The purpose is to explore novel methodological approaches to study resistance against extractivism and environmental injustice, challenging conventional ways of carrying out research within social sciences. Today, we have a pleasure to have a keynote speech by Dr. Chapi Wilson on Gonzo geography on the extractive frontier. Chapi is a lecturer in human environmental inter interactions at Bangor University. He is carrying out research at the intersections of human geography and development studies. His research focuses on the spatial, ideological, and insurrectional dimensions of the political ecology of development in the urban Anthropocene. Chapi carries out critical research on extractivist, infrastructural, and urbanizing mega projects and ethnographic explorations of the radical political possibilities that can em emerge within the violence, failure, and contestation of such projects. He has conducted field, field research in Mexico, Uganda, Ghana, Ecuador, and Peru. We also have uh, an honor to have uh, uh, two well-known commentators here. Professor Sarah Green from Social and Cultural Anthropology, and Professor Teivo Teivainen from World Politics, University of Helsinki. We have also participants online who are all warmly welcome. And just to inform you that tomorrow we will have the panel discussion on methodological approaches to study extractivism and their transformative alternatives. Uh, at, at from 10 to 12 Helsinki time. It will be in this same place. And it, you can also attend uh, online via Zoom. So, Chapi, warmly welcome. And the floor is yours. Okay, does this mic pick me up? I'm standing. Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so... Thank you very much for being here and thank you very much indeed to the organizers, uh, in particular to Marcus Kroger, Tevo Devainen, Anya Nigren, and also Alexander Dunlap um, for bringing me over here and for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in this way in, in what you're doing. Um, I also want to or must begin by expressing my unconditional solidarity with the people who are currently being slaughtered in Gaza and also with the innocent Israelis who died at the hands of Hamas. And I wish to express my horror and disgust and rage at what the American and Israeli war machine is doing in Gaza as we speak genocide that it's committing. I'm an American citizen, and I've had plenty of reason to be disgusted with the regime that claims to represent me in the past, but never more so than today. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about today is the struggles I'll be depicting in Latin America perhaps cannot be compared to what's happening in Gaza, and yet uh, they are struggles against global capitalism, and it's the same system that finds its most vile expression in what's going on right now there. Um, it must stop, and it will not stop. And global capitalism must stop, and it will not stop. And this is our predicament. Okay, so let me begin. Over the past few years, I have been developing an approach to researching and writing about the political ecology of extractive frontiers based on the gonzo journalism pioneered by Hunter S. Thompson in the late 1960s and early 1970s. 
Gonzo rejects the mainstream journalistic pretense of objectivity as, quote, a pompous contradiction in terms, end quote, and places the journalist at the center of the action based on the principle that, quote, the writer must be a participant in the scene. Thompson is best known for his personal documentation of drug-fueled decadence in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. But his gonzo experiments also included politically charged works that reported on his direct involvement with radical social movements and rebel biker gangs, through which he sought to gain a deeper insight into these renegade collectives than was possible from the perspective of the supposedly external observer. My talk today will aim to convince you that this gonzo approach is well suited to documenting the renegade politics and subaltern cultures of resource extraction zones in ways that can challenge and disrupt both mainstream and critical assumptions about such situations. I will begin with some brief introductory remarks about what I call gonzo geography. I will then read a series of extracts from my recent gonzo experiments in Ecuador and Peru. I will conclude with a few reflections on what these experiments might have to say about the central themes of this workshop. How do I change slide? Hunter S. Thompson committed suicide in 2005. Had he lived, he would no doubt have been amused to learn that his approach had inspired a scholarly research methodology, given his contempt for academia. In his words, quote, professors are a sour lot in general because they have to wake up every morning and be reminded of a world they'll never know. Unquote. Needless to say, there are plenty of exceptions to this rule, including all of us, of course. But there is indeed something sour and stagnant about the way our profession tends to suck the life out of vibrant realities that it feeds upon before regurgitating these realities in the dead form of scholarly prose. Thompson never went to university, but he clearly perceived that the desiccated abstraction of academic theorizing reproduced the pompous pretensions of objective journalism. And his lack of academic training gave him the freedom to develop his own idiosyncratic yet coherent anti-academic approach. In the words of one commentator, quote, Thompson never sat down to formulate his ideas systematically in the abstract. Instead, he composed everything in response to some experience. He was a materialist and an empiricist, seeking the foundations of his writings in the lives of actual human beings. Thompson referred to his gonzo methodology as edge work, in which the journalist joins the subversive protagonists of their stories in violating the limits set by social norms and legal order. Reflecting on his experience of riding with the Hells Angels in the 1960s, when they were an illegal organization of marginalized renegades, he wrote, the edge, there is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. A gonzo approach to geographical research is therefore necessarily based on full immersion in the intense events it documents as the only means of grasping their inner truth. This truth often proves to be at odds with preconceptions of such events based on external observations. It is in this respect that gonzo geography can make its most significant contribution to scholarly literatures on the politics of resource frontiers, in which those seen to be resisting extractive capital are frequently romanticized in problematic ways. In his book on the Hell's Angels, Thompson challenges such romanticized representations, insisting that, quote, the fact that people are poor or discriminated against doesn't necessarily endow them with any special qualities of justice, nobility, charity, or compassion, end quote. Crucially, it is precisely through his refusal to fetishize the bikers 
and his insistence on a stark depiction of their brutal reality that their humanity is able to emerge. Through the practice of edge work, Thompson gradually gains their trust and experiences a communal ethic grounded not in ideology, but necessity. In his words, quote, there is nothing verbal or dogmatic about it. They just couldn't make it any other way. This spontaneous communism, as we will see, is also a factor in the stories that I will go on to tell today. Thompson didn't pioneer edge work alone. A lesser known exponent of the practice was his friend, the radical Chicano lawyer, Oscar Zeta Acosta. Like Thompson, Acosta immersed himself in extreme experiences, which he reported in lurid and highly personal prose. In The Revolt of the Cockroach People, Acosta provides an inside account of the Chicano movement in Los Angeles in the late 1960s, including detailed descriptions of his, of his involvement in riots, firebombings, and pitched battles with the police, as well as court cases he was fighting on behalf of his fellow Chicanos and the parties and orgies that took place when they escaped the cops or got off without charge. Like Thompson, Acosta portrays his subaltern protagonists not as pure moral beings, but as dirty-talking, drug-fueled, double-dealing, street-fighting hoodlums who nonetheless practice a radical politics and who nonetheless have Acosta's full and unqualified support. As will soon become clear, I have followed Acosta and Thompson in presenting a similarly unflinching image of the frontier proletariat of the Amazonian regions of Ecuador and Peru. The resulting representations are raw and occasionally jarring. My aim, however, is not to cause gratuitous offence, but to remain faithful to the anarchic spirit of the subaltern subjects whose struggles and rituals, in whose struggles and rituals I was permitted to participate. A gonzo approach to such situations, in Thompson's words, aims, quote, to write about an extreme reality as close to the bone as I can get into hell with the consequences, end quote. Gonzo geography is thus about form as well as method. The challenge lies not only in full involvement in events, but also in communicating this experience in a direct and unmediated way. To this end, Thomas wrote in, Thompson wrote in unvarnished prose from a first person perspective, basing his text directly on his notes and transcripts and maintaining a frenetic pace throughout. As he put it, the basic concept was to lash the whole thing together and essentially record the reality of an incredibly volatile event as it was happening, from an eye in the eye of the hurricane, as it were. What I would like to preserve is a kind of high-speed cinematic real record of what the situation was like at the time, not what the whole thing boils down to or how it fits into history. I've followed Thompson's lead in this regard in the extracts I'm about to read. They are written in the first person and the present tense. The actions and events are described in language that aims to remain as close to the bone as possible. And the narratives themselves contain no conceptual reflections apart from those hinted at in my original field notes. I'll start with two extracts from my recently published book, Extractivism and Universality. The book provides a gonzo account of an uprising in a town called Dayuma on an Ecuadorian oil frontier known as the Savage Road, in which mestizo and, and indigenous oil workers confronted the combined forces of an exploitative multinational oil company and a militarized neoliberal state. A sit-down strike for better pay and conditions was transformed into a blockade known as a paro after the leaders of the strike were seized by the police. The installations of the oil company were shut down and a permanent blockade was installed under continual threat of police and military violence. The first extract begins on the fifth day of the Paro with a confrontation between members of the Shuar indigenous nationality participating in the uprising and a supposedly grassroots counter movement that has suddenly emerged to challenge the striking workers. We roar into the parking lot and charge into the volleyball court where the meeting is taking place. But what we find is not the massive popular mobilization that we had feared. The counter movement, it turns out, amounts to fewer than 50 people who were probably paid to be here. Now they are cowering on their concrete seats as a gang of spear wielding indigenous women rushes furiously towards them. 
the governor who organizes the counter movement on behalf of the oil company has quickly disappeared, but someone else has been caught with his pants down. Vilmer Armas, the local councillor and one-time rebel leader who was beaten and imprisoned during a military crackdown in 2007, only to subsequently join the very same government that, that had repressed him. He has always insisted that he did so to better defend the interests of the people. Okay, so what the hell is he doing here? The Shwa women veer to, away from their confrontation with the counter movement and head towards Armas, who is backed up by a group of cops. Rosa Kapaku takes the lead and she is apoplectic. You are working very badly, sir. Rosa begins with admirable restraint. No, says Armas flatly, in the absence of a plausible excuse. He is sneering and squirming as Rosa closes in. You were elected by the people to support the people, not to betray the people. The rest of the Shua women crowd around them. I represent everyone, Armas replies in his smug manner, rocking back on his heels with his briefcase held before his crotch. You are betraying the people, Mr. Councillor. Rosa insists. Her voice is rising and she is jabbing her finger ever closer to his smirking face. At this point, a convoy of motorbikes and pickups filled with men from the Paro barrels into the parking lot and begins circling around it in front of the open-sided building. They are brandishing spears and revving engines in an unambiguous threat of physical violence. We march outside to join them and the convoy heads back down the hill towards the blockade. Word soon comes that the counter movement has dispersed. Nothing is heard of it again. Another failed gambit of state and capital. The paro continues with greater conviction and the oil company is back to square one. The confrontation has intensified the militancy of the paro and the attempt of the governor to generate divisions has had the unintended consequence of broadening its popular support. Even the president of the parish council here in white has now decided to align herself firmly with the uprising. She arrives with a municipal sound system which she lends to the Paro as a symbol of the council's support. Within minutes it is wired up and indigenous folk songs and mestizo cumbias are blasting across the jungle. The Shuar throw on their ceremonial dress and launch into a series of impassioned dances, first men, then women, then children, then men and women together, and finally everyone. The same Schwar song is repeated again and again, both mournful and uplifting, as they dance in radiant sunshine on the savage road with all the weight of state and capital aligned against them. The song is sung by a choir of Schwar women and concerns the location of their culture in the world, but it does not speak of the rooting of a specific identity in an established territory. Instead, it addresses this historical displacement of the Schwar from the southern Amazon and their arrival here when the Savage Road was first cut through the jungle three decades ago. And although its lyrics are in Schwa and cannot be understood by many of the crowd, they resonate with the experience of alienation shared by other elements of this frontier proletariat, drawn to the Savage Road by similar processes of dispossession, exploitation, and impoverishment. I wander far away in another land, a land I have never known. I am here dancing to this music. I have come from another land and now I am here. The song then shifts from the singular to the plural, from the particular to the universal, and from a sense of disorientation to an affirmation of uprooted existence. Why are we here? Is this not our land? We as First Nations are here. We are present. Inspired by the emotion of the moment, a Schwar man plugs in the microphone and begins to shout over the music, his thickly distorted voice mingling with the delicate harmonies of the folk song. Now is our moment. Now we are not like we like before. Now we are new. The revolution is here. The revolution has to happen, compañeros. The dancing intensifies and the crowd around the dancers begin chanting responses to his interjections as the song starts up again. Dayuma Allah, arriba. This dance asks for resolution. These children ask for peace, tranquility, and development for everyone. Si o no, compañeros. Si. We are revolutionaries. We are fierce. We are united. By the time I return to Dayuma a year later, 
the rage and revolt of the paro had been replaced by fear and loathing. Walking around the town, I could sense the animosity and distrust seething below the surface, and I was sure that some of it was directed against me. Almost everyone had sold out in some way, and they didn't want me hanging around, asking questions and causing trouble. After all, either I was a spy for CPP, the oil company, or I was an enemy of CPP, and either way, I was bad news for them. One evening I met with Rosa Kapaku, the most bellicose of all the Shuar women during the paro who had emasculated Vilmer Armas in the volleyball court. She was waiting in the shadow of a doorway on the corner of a side street. She didn't want to be seen with me in public in case word got back to CPP. She had just finished her shift after securing a three month post with the company in the negotiations that brought the paro to an end. She knew she would be laid off once the three months were up. But Rosa was a single mother and she could not risk this rare opportunity for a monthly minimum wage. She told me that her brother Marco's house had been burned down by CPP as punishment for his role in the paro. I asked if I could visit them in their community, but she told me not to come. If they see you there, they might fire all of us, she said. Now the company has us like this, she added, and made a motion like the ringing of a wet rag. Later that evening, I headed into town to find some food. Groups of men were gathered around bottles of cheap spirits in the darkness on the edges of the road. I ducked into a, inside a barbecue place at the bottom of the hill. It was empty except for a table at the back with a Waurani indigenous leader, Diana Obatawi, was sitting with her sisters. The last time I had seen Diana, she had gleefully described how the Obatawi clan had run the state oil company Petra Amazonas out of their territory. And when the army arrived to defend the company, they had chased them out as well, slapping their asses with the flat sides of their machetes. Now Diana and her sisters were getting drunk with a group of men from the same oil company. I sat down with them and the bottles kept coming thick and fast. Petro Amazonas was picking up the tab, they explained, and the recent violent conflict between the two parties seemed to have been forgotten. There was a lot of lewd humor and double entendre and Diana was getting on particularly well with one of the men. He leaned over to me laughing and told me that Diana loves me one minute and has a spear against my neck the next. Everyone was wrecked by this point and the same guy started giving me tips on how to deal with Diana's father, a legendary Waurani warrior who allegedly worked as a hitman for oil companies and timber mafias, murdering members of indigenous groups living in voluntary isolation on resource-rich land. Miguel used to be much more aggressive, the old man confided, but he still loves whores. And if you sit him down in front of a porn movie, he's happy. They were still growing strong when I staggered out of there a couple hours later. It had been a difficult experience for me to grasp. When I described the scene to an outreach worker who had worked closely with the Waurani over many years, he explained it in straightforward terms. People are looking for ways to survive and adapt, he said, and they get infected by the spirit of oil, which is very dark. These were the kinds of situations in which consciences were bought and divisions were sown. The guys from Petra Amazonas, who were buying the drinks for Diana and her sisters, were playing the same game as the CPP representatives who secretly negotiated with community leaders to bring the paro to an end. They were all dedicated to playing people off and turning them against each other to guard against the kind of unity that had emerged in the paro. In the words of one Quechua indigenous leader, there was unity but then they separated into different groups. There were accusations against the leaders, accusations against the parish authorities. The company used some very technical people to weaken the entire group. In other words, the company saw that everyone was united and sent people to divide them. They created an internal division and the strength was lost. I will now read two passages drawn from a 12-month urban ethnography that I recently conducted in the city of Iquitos in the Peruvian Amazon. The first is a translation of a piece of gonzo journalism that I published in one of the two main newspapers of Iquitos. The article celebrates the mass carnival of the city's most notorious slum, which is inhabited by indigenous and mestizo migrants. The carnival is usually stigmatized in the local media as a devil-worshipping cult and a festival of vice performed by drug addicts and delinquents. My article 
you can see there, was the first to report from inside the event. Instead of countering the prevalent media stereotypes with a wholesome account of local custom and tradition, I sought to subvert these stereotypes by driving them beyond their lim limits and into their inversion. Carnival Sunday in Bajo Belen, one of the most marginalized and precarious corners of Iquitos. I get to the port of Pueblo Libre in the heart of the slum around midday. A gang of masked dancers are drinking agua ardiente. One of them passes me a bottle and tells me what the devil means to him. I believe in him. He's a cool guy. The devil sorts you out. He asks for the devil's help to keep me working instead of stealing. He's been dancing for 10 years now and has two more to go. All the masked dancers of Pueblo Libre pledged to dance for 12 years in honor of the devil. Six dressed as a demon and six as a woman who accompanies the demon for the day. Those who break their pledge are said to die soon after. But the devil celebrated by the mass dancers is not the evil devil of the Christian faith, but the morally ambivalent supai of pre-colonial Amazonian tradition, with which the Christian devil was combined by missionaries eager to colonize indigenous minds and discredit indigenous beliefs. Unfortunately for the missionaries, in Iquitos, the carnival and its devil have escaped ecclesiastical control and mutated into a depraved fiesta. And the devils of Pueblo Libre stage the wildest party of all. Soon the port is filled with hundreds of dancers who storm through the slum to a concrete warehouse in which they change into their costumes. Most have replaced the natural masks of indigenous tradition with latex Halloween merchandise of westernized consumer culture. But this is not just another case of the erosion of local tradition by the forces of global capitalism. Instead, the masks have been modified in accordance with their wearers' own tastes and imaginations, contributing to a cannibalistic fusion of multiple cultural forms. The dancers change in the dark so the crowds outside will not know who they are when they emerge, or which one among them is the real devil. They say that Lucifer himself joins them in this room, in, in this room and slips outside among, alongside them, undetected, as the door is flung open and the demons rush out into the light. Purple skeletons, red-eyed apes, decomposing clowns, a dissolute rabble of leprous demons escorting a luscious retinue of transsexual courtesans. They fling themselves around the nearest umisha, one of countless palm trees hacked out of the surrounding jungle, adorned with plastic household goods and erected on every street corner in the slum. This palm will be felled with the rest and stripped of its wares, at the carnival's conclusion. Now it is surrounded by a throng of monsters flailing to a mutant masked up modern version of the traditional carnival flute and drums fled through a distorted sound system to become a heavy electronica. The leader gives a sharp whistle and the swarm of motley beings seethes on to the next umisha, buckets of river water hurled upon them from the upper floors. The air is thick with the sickly scent of marijuana, haggard trolls gyrate with leery werewolves gagging gimps cavort with slavering simians. We drink bowls of masato and cups of aguardiente distributed for free from barrels by the roadside and scrabble for handfuls of candy chucked from makeshift balconies. Fat goblins slowly kick and stamp in the center of the circle while trans women kick off their heels and sprint, sprint around the outer limits. Firecrackers explode under the dancers' feet. Wooden phalluses and rubber dildos are thrusted and waved. A werewolf throws his partner onto her back and mounts her, turning his blindly lolling snout towards the leering crowd. Masks are torn off and thrown around like decapitated heads. There is no more circling in homage to the Umisha, just crepuscular monsters raving in the dusk. As I stumbled home that light night, I drunkenly wondered what we could learn from the mass dancers of Pueblo Libre. There were no explicit politics to their performance, and yet it delivered a powerful message of anarchic autonomy. The police stayed away, and candy, alcohol, and music were all laid on for free. The transgressions of the mass dancers and trans women were a collective statement of emancipation from church and state. And who, after all, are the devils in this case? The Peruvian Amazon was once known as the devil's paradise the title of a book that revealed the genocidal crimes of the rubber boom in the region. In the mass dance of the devils of Pueblo Libre, this paradise of extractive capital is inverted in the utopian recuperation of an impoverished corner of Iquitos 
by the descendants of the indigenous workers enslaved, tortured, and murdered in the extraction of the wealth on which this once prosperous city was built. Not utopian in the sense of the pastoral indigenous paradise of white liberal fantasy, but in the sense of the wild embrace of this diabolical inheritance leaping from its urban tomb in the form of its triumphant undead. In April of this year, police were sent to evict the so-called human settlement of the Yakuts on the outskirts of Iquitos. <clears throat> in the absence of urban planning or a social housing program, Iquitos has expanded through illegal invasions of the surrounding jungle, most of which is owned by powerful businessmen with political connections. Via Cruz was an invasion of this kind, which is inhabited by the same fusion of indigenous and mestizo migrants that inhabit Bajo Belen. As in the case of my depiction of the carnival in Belen, the following text is adapted from an article that I published in the local press in the style of gonzo journalism. Based on my participation in the community's resistance to the attempted eviction, like the Belen Carnival, such resistances are typically represented by the local media as the criminal actions of dangerous delinquents. Again, my strategy was not to provide a sanitized alternative vision of the struggle, but to portray its un unvarnished reality in such a way that its utopian truth emerged. Soon news arrives that the police are amassing at the far end of the two kilometer track leading from the highway to the entrance to Via Cruz. Children are waving white flags and singing hymns amidst the black smoke of burning tires as we leave the makeshift settlement and advance hesitantly along the track. Trees are hacked down with machetes to form instant barricades. Suddenly we see hundreds of cops rounding a distant curve and advancing down the straight dirt road followed by a line of bulldozers. The handful of massed youths in their path seems momentarily perplexed by the monstrous inequality of the inevitable battle. Then the first tear gas canisters are fired and the cops are approaching fast. Fireworks are launched from the nearest barricade. Someone shouts that the police are armed with shotguns. A group of young guys plunges into the roadside jungle, carrying a beer crate of Molotov cocktails, which are lit and thrown towards the cops exploding in flames along the road. The police fire into the forest and advance again. A masked man is using a metal pole to break up the concrete path that runs along the side of the track, making ammunition to be thrown or shot from catapults. Another round of tear gas is launched, the canisters landing on the ground around us as we run. Young women with their faces covered with bandanas are running to the front line with plastic bottles of water and vinegar mis mixture to douse the faces of those worst, worst affected by the tear gas. Two yellow butterflies flip through the battlefield. A young guy loads a homemade gun with a shotgun shell and fires. The cops have reached a barricade formed by a fallen tree alongside a patch of jungle. The growl, growl of a chainsaw being fired up as they start cutting their way through. More masked guys charge to the front, armed with makeshift guns. Come on, come on! The air is filled with the white smoke of the tear gas and a constant boom of shots and explosions. Blood pisses down the face of a young guy hit with buckshot, the roar of a powerful mo motorbike accelerating from down the road behind us. The guy is loaded on the back, and the bike speeds back to Via Cruz through clouds of tear gas and chaotic motion. There are calls for more cartridges from the front line, and the motorbike comes roaring back to deliver further ammunition. And imperceptibly at first, but with ever-increasing clarity, the police are beginning to fall back. Then the shout goes up, they're retreating, come on neighbours, come on. And now we are all running forward. The road is filled with broken bottles, spent cartridges, tear gas canisters. The verges are charred and smouldering. The cops retreat slowly, firing tear gas as they go. Then there are shouts of indignation and I see that a guy just in front of us has collapsed and is bleeding heavily from his stomach. He's been shot, not with buckshot this time, but with a proper bullet. Four others pick him up and run back through the barricades. His face is grey and calm. Thick blood soaks his jeans and oozes through the hands beneath his back. The motorbike roars forward to collect him, but they can't get him on, and instead they try to treat him on the road. They shot him and he's dying, says one man. He's fucking dying in front of us, says another. 
A woman is running the other way in tears. I don't know where my husband is, she said. Someone points in the direction of the fox and says, he's in the front. But the road ahead is open. The police have retreated into the distance, the odd plume of tear gas still punctuating the skyline. People are carrying shotguns back from the front line after chasing the rapidly retreating cops all the way back to the highway. Chants go up of, Via Cruz, Via Cruz. A man standing on the roadside brandishes a homemade gun and roars, we're going to make the corrupt governments respect us, motherfucker. The crowd swells as we approach the human settlement created by similar invasions that line the last stretch of road approaching the highway, and the sense of collective indignant triumph grows. The inhabitants of the other invasions have gathered along the road and are cheering us along. By the time we hit the highway, the cops have gone and a spontaneous street party block, blocks the road amidst the detritus of incinerated tires and the blazing midday heat. Many of the men are still masked and still carry wooden clubs and chunks of concrete torn from the broken roads. Everyone is jumping in unison, shaking their fists in the air, chanting the name of Via Cruz and roaring their affirmation of the unity and victory of the people. A woman in a pair of pink mini mouse shorts, kicks up her heels on the molten asphalt, surrounded by a hundred rebel bodies, leaping and moshing in raging celebration of their impossible victory. In the stories that I've told, I've tried to stay true to Hunter S. Thompson's call to be an eye in the eye of the hurricane. As we've seen in his reporting on such situations, Thompson was less interested in what it all boils down to or how it fits into history. But I am not a journalist, but an academic, at least of some weird kind. And so I will conclude by briefly considering what it all boils down to in relation to the themes of this workshop on extractivism and alternatives. The scenes that I depict do not seem to hold out much hope for radical alternatives to extractivism emerging from the subaltern spatial practices of resource extraction zones. The indigenous-led blockade of the Ecuadorian oil frontier was not in opposition to extractivism, but was demanding local participation in the oil industry and a bigger local cut of the proceeds. The carnival, celebrated in the predominantly indigenous slum of Bajo Belen, was not seeking to preserve the indigenous rituals from which it had emerged, but was fusing them with a cannibalized, with cannibalized Western cultural forms in the delirious affirmation of salvage punk survival. And the invasion urbanism of Via Cruz was not based on the conservation of the jungle on the outskirts of Iquitos, but on its theft from large landowners and its destruction to make way for self-built housing for the poor, many of whom were indigenous migrants abandoning rural riversides for the modern city. In all three cases, the romantic fantasy of the indigenous community defending a sustainable relationship to a spiritualized nature, which is so prevalent in the literature on extractivism and resistance in the Amazon, was conspicuous by its absence. A disjuncture between this fantasy and the findings of my Gonzo explorations is well illustrated by a news story published by a leading periodical of the international press. Reporting on the national uprising that shook Ecuador in 2019, the story quoted a member of the Waurani indigenous nationality who had come to the capital city of Quito to participate in the anti-government protests. Even in the colorful crowd of indigenous protesters, the leader stood out. Carrying a spear, her face covered in tattoos, she wore a feather headband and a rainbow colored bead necklace. She had come from Oriana, a lowland province of, of rainforests, parakeets, and fiercely independent tribes who have resisted all attempts to integrate them into modern life. The woman in question was none other than Diana Obatawa, the Waurani leader I had encountered getting drunk with the men from the state oil company a couple of years earlier, as reported in the second of the extracts I've just read. On that occasion, she had traded her feather headband and rainbow colored bead necklace for hot pants and hooped earrings and was thoroughly enjoying her integration into modern life. 
so much so that she was campaigning against government plans for greater and greater environmental protections, which would have prevented her from granting further dr drilling rights to oil companies operating on her territory. The newspaper that published this story was far from being a radical left-wing publication. But the same fantasy of the noble savage is prevalent on the left. And it is notable that the, this Waurani woman's community and other indigenous communities along the Savage Road have lost the support of supposedly pro-indigenous NGOs since they stopped performing their prescribed identity as the noble savage. When given the choice between this fantasy and real indigenous people engaged in real struggles for survival under brutally difficult conditions, too many of those on the anti-extractivist left would appear to prefer the former. But the latter, I would suggest, is where true emancipatory possibilities can be discovered. The stories I have told today are of real indigenous peoples engaged in real struggles and celebrations and are filled with desperate positivity and revolutionary potential. This potential only emerges if we are willing to view their protagonists as Hunter S. Thompson viewed the Hells Angels and as Oscar Zetha Costa viewed the Chicano street gangs. That is, without the prejudices of our own preconceptions. In all three cases, indigenous and mestizo elements of marginalized and impoverished populations flung together by the brutal dynamics of extractive capitalism were united in collective performances of an insurgent universality, transcending cultural differences and historical antagonisms. Insurgent universality surges up from below in the urgent staging of the utopian actuality of equality and freedom. In her history of the Haitian Revolution, Susan Buck Morse has referred to this radical form of universality as a universal humanity. The definition of universal history that begins to emerge here is this. Rather than giving multiple distinct cultures equal due, whereby people are recognized as part of humanity indirectly through the mediation of collective cultural identities, human universality emerges in the historical event at the point of rupture. It is in the discontinuities of history that people whose cultures have been strained to breaking point give expression to a humanity that goes beyond cultural limits. And it is in our empathic identification with this raw, free and vulnerable state that we have a chance of understanding what they say. Common humanity exists in spite of culture and its differences. The universal dimension of the struggles and celebrations that I have depicted today would have been imperceptible to anyone not directly participating in the events themselves. Reflecting on his own involvement in such events, the communist philosopher Alain Badieu has noted that a new political situation can only be known from within its own process. Ordinary news and commentary are not enough. And there is a very simple reason for this. Political novelty, which is subjective, does not allow itself to be grasped from the outside at the moment of constituting itself. This is the essence of Hunter S. Thompson's method, which is likewise based on full immersion in the intense events it documents as the only means accessing their energy. Gonzo, in other words, turns out to be a good way of grasping the insurgent universal as it emerges at the moment of constituting itself. And this is so precisely because of its insistence on the primacy of the particular and the subjective. And this, I believe, is the true political value of the Gonzo approach. Thank you so much, Jackie. It was really interesting and touching. And now we have time for commentators. So Sarah and Tavo, you might want to come here forth.
Thank you. Um, very a gripping, powerful story and uh, and account and a lot to think about. And this is hot off the presses because I, I didn't get access to the paper in advance, you should know. So this is completely from, I mean, uh, things I thought were very persuasive and strong about this is <clears throat> the messiness of the story. Uh, the inability to separate good, bad, right, wrong into neat cultural and social tropes or groups um, is truly powerful in this account. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of um, Roy Ellen's ethnographic work. Uh, it was called What the Black Elk Left Unsaid, which was about the fact that indigenous people are not born with some kind of genetic propensity to protect nature and uh, that the assumption that they are is some strange ethnocentricity that shouldn't really be imposed on them. And it also separates the understanding of what people are going through. Um, and your point that the, the universal element is, is there but one element, and that perhaps Gonzo is part but not part of finding some other aspects was was a, a very interesting one and um uh i had a couple of questions before i go on about gonzo which really interests me at speaking as an anthropologist and therefore what kind of relationship gonzo might have with ethnography um the edge seems like a kind of that you mentioned at the beginning a kind of border um both symbolic and physical, perhaps? And if so, what is it that's transgressed when you go over it in the kind of Hunter Thompson view? Um, uh, and Oscar Zeta Acosta about the revolts of revolting people um, and that who are revolting but still right. And, and that the difference there maybe is between the kind of legal, what legally might be right as opposed to what morally might be right or what in some notion of justice. So where where is the judgment there? Where where does the, what is the judgment doing there? If you're saying, okay, these people are revolting, they're disgusting, they're cockroaches, they're whatever, uh, but they're also right. So what's judgment doing there? Um, on Gonzo, the idea of there being no separation between the describer and described, no claim to neutrality, so no analysis. Uh, it it makes sense why Hunter Thompson didn't like academia if he thought of academia as a positivist science that must, excuse my phrase, extract itself from the world it describes. Um, Yet we live in different times now, I hope, uh, and ethnography has, in some senses, never made that pretense to objectivity. Uh, or when it did, it failed, in my view. So Gonzo might be another way to say what ethnographers do to try to understand what things mean to people and perhaps how it feels. Um, at the same time, there was an analysis in this paper. Uh, it, it, the talk of alienation, of exploitation, of uprootedness, of revolution, which language which was not only yours, but also shared in part by the people you were talking about. That language is from a particular paradigm. Uh, a set of ideas that came from the writings of particular Europeans in the 19th century. Um, as did the Spanish language in much of in which much of this was described. So that question of the relation between the universal and the local is a really interesting one. So the question then is Gonzo means no separation, but what kind of location is that? How does it relate to this kind of global extractivism, global reach of both the ideas that that inform global capitalism and the ideas that inform global communism. 
uh, and ideas about revolution. So from what location does Gonzo operate? Um, and in some senses, the, 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 the supai devil is different. Uh, it's a devil unfamiliar to us as an audience. Um, the, the, we, we can't know in the way that you know what was going on there. Uh, we, we rely on your words. And, and you are gonzo, we are not. Or we weren't there. And so how does gonzo geography account for what Doreen Massey once called the simple fact of being always somewhere in particular and therefore not somewhere else? Uh, how can Gonzo geography overcome that without some claim to, a, I don't know, some topology or a topological twist or some way of concertinering the distance between you and you being there and us being here? Um, but I think this was a really powerful account which can add a lot to the debate that you'll be having in the next couple of days. So thank you very much. It was very good to think of. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Very dangerous. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. These these were really excellent comments. Um, and they already they they will really help me to think through what I'm doing uh, in great greater detail as as I go forward because I, I apologize for not sending you the paper earlier but I literally finished it about yeah. half an hour before I started talking so I do that too <laughs> um but but this, so this so this is very much a work in pro progress um and uh and the way I developed it in that in the book was was quite minimal compared to how I want to take it forward and uh, these are very useful um suggestions and things to think about uh in terms of how it relates to the the anthropological literature. Um, I'm not an anthropologist, and I continually run into trouble for claiming to be doing, doing ethnographies with anthropologists who, talk, who tell me that I, I'm doing no such thing. Um, there is one interesting. Um, the, uh, the actual when I when I, I um, became interested in or decided to take a Gonzo approach purely through chance initially because my my brother actually gave me a book of Hunter S. Thompson's writings as an antidote he wrote in, in, in the dedication, as an antidote to academic, to all your academic nonsense, you know, read some of this instead. And so I, and so I, or read some of this as to give you a break from it, you know. And so I did end up reading a lot of, a lot of that anthology and then, um, and really enjoying it. And then when I was in Ecuador, I was researching something, something else. And I suddenly got that, that, that uprising took place where I was just by chance. And so I ended up being within it for nine days. And I didn't really have a, methodological hand handle to make set you know I was, I was i was in the situation i had to and, and all i could really relate to what my knowledge my existing knowledge was was what i'd read of his and it seemed to resonate in particular was writing on the on the hell's angels and so i kind of went with that and then went back and looked in more detail um into that approach and afterwards and the only other academic source i can find for draw, using hunter s thompson methodologically is actually in the field of criminal anthropology or anthropological criminology or however you say it. uh there's 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 a there's a book um jeff farrell i don't know if you've heard of jeff farrell he's a uh, a book an edited volume called edge ethnography where he takes thompson's ideas of edge work and mobilizes them his and the argument in that book is that uh, is that crime and the life the life of crime criminal criminals and organized crime and so on has all kinds of internal processes and 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 also kind of affects and emotions that can't be can only be grasped by by in somehow participating and so there's a series of writers who 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 who, who embed themselves in various kind of criminal activities and gangs and then write from that experience um and i think there again i'm not i'm not skilled enough in in anthropological theory to to be able to make this claim Confidently myself, but what what their kind of angle was is and their argument why why an edge approach is requ 
inspired or is useful in in criminal criminological anthropology or anthropological criminal criminology or whatever it is um is that although that although anthropologists have indeed been talking about these kinds of methods and and the and, and the division between uh, and the impossibility of objectivity and so on for for many decades um the kind of imposition of one methodology or another that even if it's a participatory observation or whatever um still ends up introducing some kind of barrier and that, that they they see this as as a way of potentially transcending that although of course and as, as you rightly say and as i should probably be a little bit more reflexive in the way i talk about this that this is inevitably in, an impossible task the idea that you're going to abolish that boundary and actually in the book um in the in the conclusion i do reflect on this to a to a certain extent and you know it would be absurd for me to claim that i was really just one of them in that struggle i wasn't i was a white privileged white academic and at any point i was free to walk away from there and fly over to the other side of the world and get out of trouble which is actually is exactly what i did in the end in fact because the police ended i there was a whole story i won't go into now but i needed to get out of there and i was able to because of my privileged position right so there's no doubt that those kinds of structural privileges and inequalities are in a sense impossible to move beyond and 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 the attempt to do so will always be incomplete and will always fail ultimately i suppose one way or another um uh what you mentioned about oscar zeta costa and they are revolting but uh, but but they are but but we still celebrate them i don't think his his point I, i'm sorry if it came across like that his his point is not that they are revolting um he's just giving a very um he's giving an account of them that could be perceived as revolting from the perspective of a kind of politically correct moralizing uh bourgeois academia that's what that's what it is um and 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 the and the use of the term cockroaches isn't for him in any sense to say that they're cockroaches it's actually a, a category they apply to themselves in terms of their status with as they perceive it within uh u.s society um yeah i think that's what i have to say unless i'm if there's something else you want to yeah no so remember. in a way uh it was a commentary against the judgment yeah as opposed to a common without sugarcoating the... yeah it wasn't say it was neither saying they are or, or are not cockroaches but it was kind of mm. affirming their self-identification as such in a way against the system that frame them in those terms and there was only the last thing was about a location which is happens to be one of my core interests in yeah no that and, that's uh, that's a very very good question i need to read Dore doreen massey on that and um yeah i'm not sure how you mediate that to be honest i mean you're right i'm i'm, I'm giving you my perspective on those events and you're having to take me at my word and there's obviously something problematic in that um i'm not sure i'm not sure how to how to but in, respond to that in a way though isn't that also what hunter thompson was doing because the people who were reading about hell's angels couldn't have really been part of it either yes <laughs> but, but what's I, I mean i what i'm saying is i don't know how I mean that is that does seem to be something that's inherent to the Gonzo approach. You go into the in the the inside of of an intense situation, and then you come out of it and report about it. And so that relationship, I guess, is going to be inevitable. I mean, I suppose the one thing I could say is that the way in which you do your reporting then matters, and and how and how you put it to use matters. Um, and so um, those articles that I wrote. Um, I also published, I was also kind of, the, the way in which I was really bought my right, so to speak, to continue within the uprising in Ecuador uh, was that I was kind of functioning as their unofficial press officer and get, getting out reports from their point of view in the on various um, networks in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in these two struggles, again, the fact that I was publishing, or not well, the first wasn't a struggle, it was a celebration, but the fact that I was publishing 
affirmative stories from within their movements um, in a context which is highly race, race, a very racist um, scenario, particularly the way in which the press, which is very connected to to the to the white uh, bourgeois class there, um, to be able to plant those kinds of perspectives within 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 that was was something that um, was appreciated by um, by those who by the by the struggle. So I guess that's part of it is being conscious about how you're then who you're addressing when you come out of there and how you and how you're addressing them. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Oh, thank you. Apologies for I'm in the middle of something to embarrass to even say what it is, so I had to run out. <laughs> uh, this was great. And 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 uh I agree with Sarah many great things also about methodology of listening. I thought it felt like, you know, we'd be in this room when Allen Ginsberg is doing Howl in, I don't know, City Lights Bookstore, and we should go like, yeah, yeah, when you were reading this. I, I like the I like that style. But I like the in the contents the the you you did the uh, sort of politics um universal humanity, insurgent politics of universal humanity. And 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 it's it's really fascinating. I mean, also I think you mentioned somewhere like in uh, did someone tell you like you know will decolonial oriented people get pissed off with your with your uh, book because of the things things you kind of say because there's this idea that there's this uh, pluriverse against sort of pretensions of universality and universality connected with something something. Uh, oppressive and and so i was thinking let's let's look at it but when i was listening to let, let's see if i can uh, use this oh, no. the, 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 this means, just to see how it works out in practice in methodology and also in political imagination about futures temporalities and and and, and, and all that so you have this okay let's assume this is an indigenous movement and in Ecuador, for example, this would be, um, I don't know, sexual diversity movements, this would be trade union women's movements, etc. So um, once in, in, actually in Peru, we had a Ecuadorian visitor and we were using this, and I don't know to what extent this, because normally we think, okay, this glory verse, just like, uh, the universalist pretensions against social amongst social movements were like, okay, here comes the vanguard and says, hey, I'm the vanguard, I'm the populist leader, I'm I'm the party, I'm something, and you all should follow me. And and this is what in more modern ideas about social movements would be the floating signifier and you know La Clo and all that, and somebody comes and do do do, and then you have Peron or Chavez or whoever and the leader. And, and and then many and, and this can be seen very concretely in Ecuador with the kind of more hierarchic traditional left, uh, conservative left in government power, and then the more radical or more indigenous, more pluriverse oriented indigenous movements. And 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 so then how do the, how do these how do these different movements connect? Because then uh, the classically universalist people would say. Okay, you are there in your relativist pluriverse, and you can't make a revolution. You can't move because you don't connect. You don't have a leader. You don't have a structure. You don't have a floating signifier that then becomes a Chavez or Peron, and 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 um, and this is a dilemma. In Ecuador, once when we were were talking about this, the thing was like, well, let, let's see mobilizations against privatization of health care system. And then you would have, let's say, the indigenous movement, the uh, gay and lesbian movement, the more broad sexual diversity movement, feminist movement, trade union movement, etc. And they were also coalescing around this thing. Okay, we are opposed to this privatization of of of, of um, health care system even if our backgrounds are different, the conception on family would be very different, assumedly, between, let's say, some people in the indigenous movement and some people in the sexual diversity movement, but still they would be together 
to pose a certain thing like privatization of the health system. And then we were semi-jokingly making fun, making fun, using politically, <laughs> sometimes they are the same thing, uh, of the fact that the flags were a little bit similar to sort of rainbow flag and the Tawanti Suyo indigenous you know, flag there and how, how, how uh, that was the symbol in, in one of the events we did. So how does this universal sort of insurgent universal universalism or universal humanity, how does it play out here? How does it help us to think like whether these movements in protests or in more broad mobilizations, uh, whether they will traditionally we would think universalism, I'm simplifying a lot, means they come together and there's a leader or some mechanism of representation here, or then there's this more pluralist, relativist kind of thing. You know, you have your thing, I have my thing, and our ontologies are so different that we, you know, we don't pretend to articulate ourselves between us too much. So uh, I was thinking about how methodologically uh, your take on the, the sort of insurgent universality helps us think about uh, how movements can find ways of working together in order to change the world or whatever they're trying to achieve. One of my things has been to look at how they learn from each other and therefore articulate without need for hierarchic leader, but also, and I'm not sure whether universality would be a term that fits here, thinking about how they will be a little by little learning from each other without one raising above the others or without having a traditional hierarchic structure in struggle that we normally call modernist universalist way of doing politics. So how would your insurgent uh, universal humanism or insurgent universalism, uh, what would it propose methodologically for whoever studies that or perhaps even for the movement, like how to achieve what they are struggling. Just thank one thing. No, thank I have you very other much. questions later. Okay, that's fantastic. No, th thank you. Um, that goes to the heart of, you know, I guess, the political <clears throat> dimension of what I was uh, talking about today. Um, so yeah, in in the book, I set this out more kind of explicitly. Uh, Insurgent universality as a kind of third way, which is neither top-down universalism nor uh, a bottom-up pluriverse. Um, but my ideas about that really came from came out of my research first on in in, that, in, in Ecuador, um, and this is what kind of gave me sort of faith in a sense in the Gonzo approach because it it was in that context that I saw that happening, and then I went back and found that there was actually a literature that was talking about this. Um, Buck Morse's book on IT, I, which I quoted, gave that big quote from, I would completely recommend anyone who hasn't read it to read. It's a beautiful book and I think a really important one that makes <clears throat> makes this argument that the way in which um, un universalism has rightly been critiqued and deconstructed by <clears throat> decolonial theory for all of its top-down, masculinist, Eurocentric, totalizing um, tendencies and history uh, but what by by setting up a kind of um, dichotomy between that top-down universalism and a bottom-up pluriverse what you lose is the possibility of a universality that is not that top-down that is not that top-down universalism um, and it is not that, and neither is it a bottom-up pluriverse or, a, as, as the Zapatistas say, a world in which ma many worlds fit. It's it's a genuine form of universality when those divisions where those divisions are broken down, but that comes from below rather than above. Um, and that's what I saw happening in in that in that uprising, and then I started seeing it happening in in other cases as well, um, as I've just been discussing. And it's less a uh, building of this university takes 
the for this universality takes the form less of a building of links between separate movements and more of a breakdown of pre-existing divisions within a kind of upsurge of rev of revolt. And so in the case of uh, the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, there were indigenous workers and black workers and mestizo workers all employed by the same oil company. And there was a, a history, and I traced that in the first kind of historical chapter of the book, the history of, of that, the way in which that region was colonized, which was a relatively recent process, which is connected to the discovery of oil there back in the late 1970s. Um, the construction of oil, oil related infrastructure and then the colonization of that region by various groups and the, both mestizo groups from the highlands ex-slave black groups from the ecuadorian coast um Shua, indigenous peoples migrating from the southern amazon um Kichwa, indigenous groups migrating from the rivers of the region and actually the only um, kind of truly indigenous group there was the Waurani, and even they had only started inhabiting that region relatively recently when they were pushed there by the by the rubber boom of, of the century previously. And so there, there was this amalgamation of all these different groups and the politics of the way in which that zone got consolidated as a kind of extractive space with all these groups within it and, of course, with extracted capital and the, and, and the militarized state there as well, was a very violent one between these groups. Um, and yet, in the context of this struggle, those divisions, at least momentarily, and it was momentary and it was fleeting, broke down, not through any kind of ideology. I think you're right, clearly they're using language of revolution and so on, so there, is, there are elements of, of political ideologies that are in there, but there was no one leading that breakdown. It was something that, that, that happened of its own accord. And interestingly, one of the phrase, and I didn't quote this in the in the, in the talk, but it, I, I, I kind of, it's central to much of the book, that the Schwa group that was kind of taking it was being, had a very kind of central role in the whole, whole thing. Uh, the phrase that, they, they, that ended up coming to be repeated over and over again throughout the struggle was, we are all indigenous, but it was, so it was interesting. Whereas a top-down universalism of the kind rightly critiqued by, by decolonial theory would have, would, have, would, have, would have said, we are all white or we are all mestizo, and it, would have, and it would have sought to erase indigenous difference. This was, we, we are all indigenous, and it was coming from the indigenous sector of the struggle themselves, but it was affirming an, an, a, a universality. We we're all we we're all indigenous, and so and so that was yeah that was how the universality emerged. And I'm, I guess, what this concept helps us to do, and what the writings on this, and I should say, um, there's a guy called Massimiliano, I think is his first name, Tomba, who actually coined the phrase insurgent universality. It's, it's not mine. I had the idea of insurgent universalism, and I thought, shit, I better just check that no one else has done this. And I googled it, and it was like the guy had just published a book called Insurgent Universality, but. He got there first, so uh, I should I should be upfront about that. Um, but what he's talking about, and what um, Buck Morse is talking about in her case of the Haitian Revolution, um, is not about the building of links between different struggles dispersed in space or dispersed in in um, in terms of their theme, uh, but or, or their identity, but rather the way in which a particular uprising allows internal divisions to, to dissolve fleetingly. Um, and, and and I'm interested in the way in which that's also connected with spontaneous forms of communism within the within these struggles. So in, in that uprising, um, there was uh, collections from communities in in the region that uh, fed um, the, the everyone involved in the in the blockade for the entire duration of the struggle. In the in the celebrations in Bajo Belen. As I mentioned, there was free alcohol and free candy and free um, there was uh, and free food. There was there was a kind of collective uh, communism within that context, and also in 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 the, in the uh, battle against the police, there was there was all kinds of there was there was a there was a kind of uh, 
clinics set up to treat, treat the wounded and there was free food and Masato again provided. And so, and so I think there's something, there's a relationship between these upsurges of insurgent universality and these upsurges of a kind of spontaneous communism. And it makes me rethink Marx's famous definition of communism as the real movement that abolishes the present state of things or the actual state of things. And that's always thought of as a kind of a movement towards some kind of great communist future. But I kind of, it seems maybe, maybe actually it only abolishes the present, the, the actual state of things for a moment. And it's that, that movement and that explosion of universe, universality and spontaneous communism is almost inevitably gets reintegrated and fails. Um, I don't have, I don't think it's my place. I don't feel like it's my place to suggest how such a thing could be built. I think it's more a case of simply um, bearing witness to its to its reality, basically. Um, and, I and I don't have a very any any very optimistic okay. kind of prospect. Just, okay, let's uh, well, probably just a universalist view, because he said now that we are all indigenous. We didn't assume the particular identity of indigenous or about the struggles, but within the particular context, the concept of universalism. Mm -hmm. So. Maybe we'll talk about this after the session, but just to then understand better what you mean by universalism. Exactly. Universality rather than universalism, because again, okay. universalism carries the idea of an ideology, whereas universality is simply a, an actuality in the moment. now being heard yeah thank you uh for a super super fresh and interesting and insightful presentation and i think uh i started to think about uh gonzo method and approach in comparison to then auto auto ethnography and kind of like the differences between those because you were talking about it as kind of the eye in the eye of the hurricane and kind of like this inside view but it's not an insider view still like Hunter S. Thompson, he was he wasn't a member of the Hell's Angels, and you, like you said, you had you had the plane ticket. So I'd like to so yeah, the request is just to kind of like maybe talk a little bit more about that and kind of comment on the on the differences or or maybe the kind of like the what does this have to give then in comparison to uh, auto ethnography and yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the extremely entertaining and utterly inspiring presentation. Um, well, first of all, just a remark that it was extremely also refreshing to just remove the sugar coating out of any kind of conflictual situation and being fine with seeing the bloodiness and messiness and horror that is somehow entered in any kind of um, conflict or contradiction that we're looking at from our academic perspective. And the question I have, it's, well, it's two. Um, the first one is about the role of temporality in, in your explanation of these absurgences. And the second one is about your idea of the political. And I'll explain better what I mean with that. Um, well, with the first one is something that you already discussed before, how you're not talking about universalism, you're talking about universality as something that is, well, as you said, an actuality, so something that kind of emerges in a certain time frame and not necessarily uh, is permanent. And somehow it is that specific moment that exists in that specific space. And it just is an opening to something that not necessarily is there before and not necessarily will be there after. So maybe a, a reflection from your point of view of what is the role of time in your uh, methodological uh, framework. And the second one was more about, it was mentioned as already by table, and that was 
this main dis- discussion before, like um, staying in Latin America, like Lao and Move, they became, of course, very famous with their uh, populist uh, socialist strategies or understanding universality as that type of uh, building chains of equivalences between uh, specific struggles and universalizing the particular, something that you have also talked about uh, in your presentation, how you can come out from one specific struggle, like from the personal and bringing it up to a societal dimension or like making it somehow relatable to other kind of struggles in a, as I said before, kind of a chain, chain of equivalences to be an empty signifier and so on. That is one approach. And the, the other approach, which is somehow also prevalent in certain um, literatures that are becoming more popular now, uh, that mo- many of us here in the room engage with uh, the growth and post growth and so on. Um, and of course, pluralism and pluriverse, etc., comes with the idea sometimes that the particular is political. So the personal is political by itself. So which kind of represents a very different idea of the political from this populist universalism um, championed by Laclau and Mouffe, especially after after him. Uh, where does your research stand in between these two poles, and what do you make out of these two? Lit- traditions in, in research and literature, which have roots in, in political movements and struggles. Fantastic questions. Thank you very much. And this has also helped me as I move forward with trying to um, <laughs> theorize this in a more robust way. This question of autoethnography uh, and this line about the eye in the eye of the hurricane, how Gonzo relates to autoethnography. Um, I actually was less true to the Gonzo method than, than, well, I decided not to be that true to Gonzo method in this respect, um, in the sense that Hunter S. Thompson does, in fact, end up being, as he develops his approach over time, um, very kind of, he becomes the center of the story, right? Um, and so that's the eye in the eye of the hurricane in the, in the sense of the, the eye. But in that quote that I gave you, he's talking about the eye in the eye of the hurricane as the sense of an observer, right? And <clears throat> an observer that's internal to the process, but is observing it from within. And there's obviously, that obviously still carries with it the kind of, positivist kind of assumptions that you pointed out but it's more that sense of the eye that i'm interested in i don't want to start getting into a kind of what does this all mean to me and what is my position within it and so on and so on and so on and so on i talk about that briefly again in the conclusion in terms of being aware of my privilege within the situation but i don't want that i don't want that kind of navel gazing as i see sometimes these tendencies towards autoethnography becoming to become the i don't want myself to become the center of the story i want what I'm able to perceive about what's going on in that kind of situation from the perspective of being as close to being fully within it as I can be to be to be to be what it's about. Um, so the eye in the eye of the hurricane, not the eye in the eye of the hurricane. Yeah. Um, hi, I was wondering if you guys can hear me, if we could ask one of the questions from the chat. Can you hear me? Ah, okay. Well, I have to. I'll, I'll have to plead ignorance to in that regard because I I'm not familiar with with that sense of auto ethnography. But that's something that I'll obviously have to be engaging with. And will and I and I thank you very much for for pushing pointing me in that direction. 
Uh, and yeah, your your questions about temporality and the political. Um, yeah, I haven't really thought about temporality uh, in the way that you suggest, but Badieu, who's uh, I draw on, and this kind of relates to your second part of the second part of your question with the, the political. I'm much more aligned with the way in which um, because there's a whole kind of Mouf and Laclau have their have their reconceptualization of the political, and then Zizek comes out of that, right? Um, and initially, it's an interesting kind of the trajectory. Zizek uh, writes the sublime object of ideology, and Laclau writes the introduction, and Zizek is very much part of that um, milieu. And then he breaks with them and moves closer to Badieu in his own in, in their reconceptualization of the political, which I which I concur with more. But I'll come back to that in a second. But Badieu's Badieu also theorizes the event as the point of rupture in which these kinds of energies are released and these possibilities are born. But then his key concern is less with the event than with what he calls fidelity to the event, which is how you then take those energies and kind of, in a sense, institutionalize them or try to like hold on to that power and turn it into a more, stretch it temp temporarily, build it into something that is, that is durable over time. Um, what I've seen in, all of these cases um, is, is is how fragile and fleeting they are, and how difficult it is for that to happen, uh, especially when the forces of the state and capital are so adept at breaking up and fragmenting any kind of shift towards that kind of that kind of universality, which is what I kind of document in the latter part of, of my book on the uprising in Ecuador, the way in which that that plays out. Um, and my sense is as soon as you, of my kind of sense is that it's almost like, and this isn't a very optimistic, um, uh, conclusion, but it's almost like these, these explosions of unity are destined, doomed to, to, to fail, to not survive. And even if they do end up being institutionalized, that takes us in its own very problematic directions, right? Um, and so I'm really not sure uh, about that step towards fidelity to the event. Um, I'm more, I think I think what I'm able to do with what I've learned from these moments is, is, is I hope to communicate that actuality. And if there is hope, and I'm not, I think hope's a very problematic category in itself for all kinds of reasons, but if there is hope, then it's in those moments. But then, but, but only because they demonstrate the actuality of, of universality, even though they can't sustain it. Um, and that, in terms of Laclau and Mouffe, I think the whole move towards the way that the, the the way in which their doctrine of populism and moves call for a left populism and so on the way in which that played out in Latin America in practice you know what I saw from the inside as I was talking to some of you at lunch of the of Rafael Correa's regime and how that took the energies of all these social movements created the space for his government to come to power and then became monstrous really in the way in which it um, then went on to repress them and to betray its promises kind of I think demonstrates the the problem with trying to hegemonize things in in that way and again my my understanding of the political is closer to Zizek's and Badieu's and it is simply and Ranciere's as well by the way simply that demonstration in moments of uprising like that of the actuality of equality right equality isn't something to be striven for uh or achieved through legislative means and so on that doesn't already exist it is it is already there and systems of oppression exist in order to negate it and in those moments of uprising its actuality is bam it's there um and that's my that's that's what the political is for me
Okay, hi, this is uh, Sophia Hagalani Albov joining from online. I have heard that you can actually hear me. Um, my apologies for uh, kind of interrupting before, um, but there's a question that's come in from the chat and I will be asking on behalf of my colleague, Maria Ernstrom Puentes. And she was wondering how you see the difference of your Gonzo narrative approach to the methodology um, your Gonzo narrative approach to the methodology in comparison to the kind of storytelling that those following the political ontology approach tend to focus on. Um, she was saying that she didn't see so much of a difference in terms of bringing forth the difference dynamics and transformations that occur in these types of territorial movements over time. Um, and also she said that neither does she see the emancipation Tory insurgent university university oh my gosh i am failing at reading out loud i apologize um and neither does she see the emancipatory insurgent university universality uh which somehow stands in opposition to pluriversality can't they exist simultaneously overlapping realities and constantly in movement i'm closing my mic now thank you <laughs> Okay, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Um, yeah, I think the Gonzo approach does fit within that broader uh, literature. Um, again, as with the um, autoethnography, I'm demonstrating my ignorance of these literatures really because there's something else it's, it's another literature that's been pointed out to me that i need to engage with by somebody else recently as well because again this is something that i'm just starting to work towards so absolutely i'll have to engage i'll have to read into that literature and see how i how i locate the gonzo approach in relation to that and in relation to the to the literature on auto ethnography um in terms of what you're saying, your question about the relationship between universality and pluriversality and whether they can coexist. Um, I think they can. I think the difficulty in them coexisting comes primarily from the tendency for um, certain proponents of the pluriverse to frame their project against universalism and to again uh not see see universalism as one option and the pluriverse as another and any kind of um universality uh gets written out of that conceptually if, if your conceptual framework and again my interest is more in what's actually happening than in prescribing what should happen but if your conceptual framework when you go into the field or whatever however you want to frame it um has a top-down universality against a bottom-up pluriverse, then when you find yourself in a situation like this, if you remain wedded to that framing of things, then a bottom-up universality is going to be invisible to you or is going to be something you want to write out of your narrative. Um, so that's why that's, I, I, think, I think the affirmation or trying to theorize uni insurgent universality and say that this is actually something that's at work in extracted frontiers in the kinds of conflicts that denizens of the pluriverse are interested in studying is important in terms of creating that kind of conceptual space for those kinds of struggles to become visible and to become legitimate from that kind of perspective. If there's nobody else I can ask maybe something so what about the generalization of these kind of findings so you mentioned that you started to observe the same kind of patterns elsewhere this kind of co-optation or kind of like the local communities not being really opposed to the continued extraction or extractivism but rather through seeking compensation so uh, and also like the claims about indigenous people like uh, you know being also like corrupted in this sense or affected by extractivism so how common is this? Like I observed it myself in Madre Dios with the gold mining expansion, like there were indigenous communities there, which were first portraying to me how they are resisting the gold mining. But then later on, I found out that actually half of the tribe is kind of like involved in gold mining and the other half is resisting, which is like a really hard situation, like how you talk about that uh, ethically and methodologically and otherwise, because 
you have that division there. But then like in the Brazilian Amazon, for example, I found that most of the indigenous groups are actually against these kind of gold mining things and extractivism. So I think we should be able to here to have the general view, although we find cases where the local people are not really against extractivism, we should be able to see that there are also many people who are actually resisting it. Like in Peru, you, if you could relate to Bakuasu, that massacre and protest, which was really important in northern Peru, and that really changed the political dynamics in Peru relating to extractivism. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, that's a really important qualification. Um, I'm not meaning to suggest that all indigenous communities are fully on board with uh, extractivist projects that are happening in their ter territories. That's clearly not the case. All, I'm, all I want to suggest is that um, I feel like what I want to problematize is the assumption that all indigenous communities are uh, behaving in that way. Because I mean, if you feel... And it's not just an academic assumption, of course, it's also very prevalent in the, in, I mean, the Guardian, almost every week, they'll have a story from the Amazon, and it will always be the same story. Bad extractive capital, good indigenous group resisting extractivism on the basis of a spiritualized relationship to nature. And what I think is really problematic about it, apart from the fact that it's, it's fetishization of indigenous peoples in a way that reproduces this discourse of the noble savage and soul, which obviously has colonial roots, is that it's all, there's also kind of an implicit racism against mestizo people in there. There was an article in The Guardian recently that really caught my attention, um, which was talking about, it was about a gold mine, an illegal gold mine, um, and it was a, in indigenous territory, and it was about how... Um, how the Brazilian police had gone in there and cleaned out the, cleared out the mine uh, and had basically left it kind of the article kind of celebrated the fact that it had left the few kind of mestizo poor miners that that hadn't fled it just left them there without food or transport or a way out of there and they're just they're just gone and abandoned them and I I somehow I sometimes think that the fetishization of indigenous identity is kind of conceal conceals or goes in hand in hand with a, a kind of uh, with a certain um, class uh, prejudice um, and in terms of and I, I also think that a lot of the cases and I mean you mentioned the Baguasu actually the Baguasu if you look into the detail of what they were calling for there it was was central to it was an increase in the amount and the percentage of oil of rents that indigenous groups were going to get from extraction in their territories, right? So that was what, although that project was framed, and there's a famous documentary made about it, which again frames it precisely in those terms of spiritualized indigenous or the, the indigenous community defending a spiritualized relationship to nature against extractive capital. In fact, like what they really wanted was a bigger cut of the rents, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but it just doesn't sit with that neat. Uh, division um and there's i mean some of the i haven't this will be i'll also write about this when i come to writing up all, all my research on iquitos but uh indigenous groups in in the peruvian amazon are working with with uh, environmental remediation companies and corrupt elements of the peruvian state oil company to sabotage oil pipelines in their territories. They um, cut them, create oil spills, and then get employed, get compensation for that and, in, and employment in the cleanup operations. And the, and, the, and, the, and the environmental remediation companies get, get, get their contracts and the corrupt elements of the Peruvian uh, state oil company get their kickbacks. And these are the kinds of complex ways in which you know oil politics again is actually playing out on the ground in many situations and again it's not it's not to deny that there are genuine struggles uh, against extractive industries in in certain places as well but the 
picture is much messier. And what I really want to affirm is that those who are involved in brutal struggles to improve their own livelihoods and really to survive in extremely complex situations who violate that kind of, who, who, who choose to make pacts with extractive industry in one way or another, um, their struggles are just as legitimate as those that correspond to what, what we, in inverted commas, think those struggles should be like. Um, yeah, thanks also from my end uh, on the presentation. It was very interesting and it was a great way of telling the story. Uh, going back to Maria Enstrom Fuentes' comment on storytelling, um, like if you haven't had the chance to to uh, work with the literature, uh, which I once again highly recommend, um, like this form of, uh, like this methodology basically works with the Gonza method through conducting, for example, interviews, and then using these interviews in sort of raw material or form and using those as the accounts, the insider accounts of what has occurred, whereas the Gonzo method clearly comes from the outside. So what I'm wondering is like, what do we gain with this outsider view? Why do we need an outsider to, yeah, tell us what happened? Why are we not simply using interviews or in this case, storytelling method, which allows us to follow like the the happening or in this case the uprising from the inside like what what is yeah why is this necessary what do we gain as yeah when reading the Gonzo method I guess thank you thank you uh yeah again I'm looking forward to engaging with this literature it's going to be super helpful in if as you say it's based a lot on using interviews the raw material form that's going to be su that's that's going to be super helpful also in terms of the way I should think through Gonzo as an approach because part of God, Hunter S. Thompson's own method actually is he's very strongly based on interviews and a lot of his um, work actually takes the form usually because he's running against a deadline which he's failing to meet he ends up just dumping the material straight into the publication and it just does take the form of direct interview transcripts. Um, and so interviews actually, although it probably didn't come through very clearly there, interviews are actually integrated into the way in which I, I tell all of these uh, stories. Um, why do we need an outsider to tell us what happened? It's a fair point. Again, the interviews are part of the way that story is told. So I'm, I'm, I'm bringing them into, I'm creating a narrative, right? And that's, I know that creating narrative itself is a problematic thing do um but i'm creating it in a combination in a combination of interviews and also direct tran transcripts of recordings that i made at the scene because these were that, that the uprising in ecuador in particular was a very um th there was it was a process that occurred through continual dialogue and, cost and, and contestation i recorded most of that and a lot of that is in the book uh, as well what my role in that is and why I'm required is probably mainly to tie the thing, tie things together. Um, I found when I, so I went, I, I, I did a lot of interviews and, and recording on, on in real time as I was there during the nine days I was in the uprising. And then I went back a month, uh, a year later and did a month of kind of interviews to kind of figure out, you know, all kinds of aspects of it that I hadn't been able to pro properly grasp at the time. But one of the things I've noticed, and I'm sure anyone who's done research in these kind of contexts will be, will be familiar with this, is the, the great difficulty that people have actually in putting things in a sequ the sequence of events they actually occurred in and kind of dating them and so on. Um, and so I think, yeah, my role is that. And it's also, I think, drawing out, and this again is where I can see that it could be critiqued, but I would say that the, you know, the phrase we are all indigenous was used, became a kind of battle cry of the uprising, but I didn't. But if I simply re relied on what people had told me about the event, I don't think they necessarily, that, that theme of universality would have necessarily come out in any 
to any great extent. There was one quote that I used there from the Kichwa leader, which was from an interview actually done a year later, where he says, there was unity, but some very clever technical people came and said that the unity was lost. So they were talking about, about that in a sense, but they weren't theorizing it. So I, I, think, the, I think the process of, of theorizing is something that I can bring, although I, I know that that could be considered problematic. Okay, thank you so much, Chucky. It was really interesting. Thank you, Sarah and Tavo, and thank you for all the audience. Very good comments and questions and very nice academic discussion. Thank you. Thank you.